On behalf of the City of Melbourne, I respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Boomerang and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'm joining you from Camaragal land today. This is a Melbourne Conversations event run by the City of Melbourne. We'll be taking questions later in the event, so please ask any questions you have in the YouTube chat. If you can't access that chat for some reason, you can always email us as well. Email those questions to conversations at melbourne.vic.gov.au. If you have just joined us, my name is Kumi Taguchi. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. And you're watching this Melbourne Conversations event run by the City of Melbourne. Our topic for today is a pretty timely one. It's called Predicting the Unpredictable. And we have two wonderful guests for you today. Cheryl Durrant is currently a fellow of the Institute for Integrated Economic Research Australia and a climate counsellor. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Kumi. Thanks for having me. And uh, hello, everyone. And I'm joining you today from across the Bass Strait on the Palawa country in Tasmania. So I acknowledge their elders past and present. Thanks so much, Cheryl. And John Thwaites is chair of the Monash Sustainable Development Institute and Climate Works Australia. Hi, John. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. And I'm joining you from the other side of Bass Strait on Bunurong country. Okay, so this is the event. Let's get it started. As always, please send us your questions. We love to have those. We'll have a chat with John and Cheryl first and take as many of your questions as we can sort of in the second half of this event. So predicting the unpredictable. Uh, Cheryl, I might go to you first. Could this have ever been predicted? Well, I think, Kumi, the, the real challenge of predicting the unpredictable and if we're talking about COVID-19, I think it was predicted or something very similar was predicted. And the question is less about can you predict the future? Because if you make a, a general prediction, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to get it right. It's, is, is the prediction useful? And I think that's where we need to focus not on the, the impossible of getting it perfect, but getting it useful. So how do we know if something's useful or not, if that prediction's useful or not? I think the important important thing, Kimi, is does it lead to action? There's a lot of, uh, I come from a military intelligence background, a former uh, director of preparedness in defence, and a lot of things that are shafted down to failure to foresee the future is actually a failure to act on the future. And so the, the key part of um, preparedness and, and getting the, the prepar preparedness for the future right is having good links between those experts, those scientific experts or future experts who are really good at understanding the risks and understanding the opportunities and making sure they're working closely with the policymakers. Often in my experience, the, the futures people are in a silo and the policymakers are in another silo. And to, to, to sort of get the action on the future predictions, you need to make sure that they're working together as part of an integrated process. John, action on future predictions, I would presume, is so prevalent and necessary if behaviour can actually change. Now, this is such an area, an area that you're so interested in. You know, predictions are one thing and having, uh, you know, areas work together is another. How do we actually get people to shift behaviour and acknowledge that change? Well, I think that these are really tough questions. And I think if there were easy answers, um, the whole world globally would be in a better place. And yeah, I might throw that, that to you, John, given that sort of your area is, is around this behavioural change. How do we change behaviours when something so dramatic like this has, has happened? Well, you've highlighted a key issue, which is that we uh, have to understand people's behavioural motivations if we're going to uh, respond to these major incidents like the COVID uh, pandemic. And there's a lot of behavioral science that helps us understand the sort of motivations we have and what you can do. A very important one are social norms, what other people are doing. So if people see people that they respect doing something, they're likely to do the same thing themselves. And so in this context, if we're trying to get people to uh, take protective behaviors again in COVID like washing their hands or keeping social distancing, it's really important that we are able to demonstrate that other people are doing that. And unfortunately, what we sometimes do is put too much focus on what a few people are doing that's wrong, and that can actually backfire and lead people to copy that behavior. 
But I also think it's interesting that uh, the whole response that Cheryl talked about, and that is do people actually act in these circumstances, is actually very much influenced by a behavioural heuristic we have, and that is normalcy. We think that things are always going to go on like they have in the past. And I was just reflecting on that before when you were talking that you go back to February this year, none of us thought this was going to happen. And yet it was happening in China and Italy because we thought things would just continue as they were here. So I think one of the big challenges is to understand that things can be different in the future. And we have to understand that people have a, a predisposition not to believe that. You do hear this a lot, don't you? Um, I just want things to go back to normal or when things go back to normal, then X, as if we're kind of holding out for this future that was our past. But it sounds like you're saying, John, that in a sense, we have to recalibrate our normal and I guess keep moving forwards on that recalibration. That's exactly right. Uh, if we're going to respond to these so-called unpredictable events, but as Cheryl pointed out, they're predictable, the problem is that because they're not normal, we naturally don't want to respond. So we have to set in train some processes that encourage people to do that. And uh, you know, one example, I think, is scenario planning. That is, set out scenarios and ask people to uh, participate in exercises to train for them. And I think a good example of that has been the bushfires where before we actually experience the bushfire season now, we work with communities to prepare. And that's been pretty successful. Like communities are responding way better now to bushfires than they did 20 years ago. The challenge with COVID is we haven't really experienced something like this in our lifetimes. And we haven't gone through one of those exercises of preparing for it. Cheryl, how do you keep preparing for the unexpected? As in, we keep talking about COVID as in it's this thing that has happened. Um, we, we can predict and, and prepare. Um, but do we have to keep that preparedness evolving throughout time, as in, you know, in six months time, I don't know where we'll be, but I would assume that we need to kind of have some level of preparedness for whatever might be coming in our future, not just for this current more sort of urgent phase of COVID. Thanks. I'd just like to, to pick up on a point that John made about the use of scenario planning. It really is one of the best tools you can use to get at those unexpected events in the future. And in this, it's different from the normal probabilistic modelling that uh, many people have businesses maybe familiar with. That tends to, to identify what's the most probable thing that might occur. And to prepare for the unexpected or predict the unpredictable, you need to look at the worst case. And defence has a, a strong history of looking at not only the most likely thing, but the, the worst thing. And scenario planning is a way to get to that because it explores a range of of possible, not necessarily probable futures. And the, the example of the defence activity we, we did with Engineers Australia about a year ago, which did look at something similar to the pandemics, was, a, was an example of scenario planning. And we, we just got to a nub of a question, which was what happened if supply was cut off to Australia? Don't worry about what crisis it was. And then explored with experts on what that might actually mean. So I think there needs to be a continuous process of scenario planning because the events that we're, we're I think the, the phrase I really hate at the moment is um, going back to normal. I, d I don't think there will be any normal going forward. Uh, we're in a, an uncertain place um, globally with the uh, increasing risks that are arising from our failure to act on climate change. Uh, if you've just joined us, and if you are joining us, thank you so much. Uh, this is a Melbourne Conversations uh, event run by the City of Melbourne. We're talking about uh, whether you can predict the unpredictable. Um, our wonderful guests today, Cheryl Durrant and John Thwaites. It's wonderful to have you join us as well. And please uh, send us your questions through the YouTube chat if you can. And if that's not possible for you, uh, you can always email your questions to um, 
conversations at melbourne.vic.gov.au and we'll be taking um, some of those questions probably in about five minutes or so. So um, it'd be wonderful to tap into our experts' knowledge on those. Uh, John, Gerald was talking about that kind of worst case scenario, that preparedness planning. What do you see as the worst case scenario in this kind of COVID world we're living in? And, and given that conversation we had a little earlier about uh, people kind of um, not necessarily being able to get their heads around something that's so abnormal, when there's a worst case scenario proposed, are we able to even imagine that and not dismiss it as, oh, that'll never happen? Well, our natural tendency will be to dismiss uh, those worst case scenarios because, as I say, we have a tendency to want things to be normal and therefore we convince ourselves that people are going to be normal. And in a way, there's been a lot of that talk uh, about the so-called recovery as though um, we can just immediately build, um, swing back to where we were, bounce back to where we were before. And there was sort of an expectation across Australia that this was all going to be over by June and we'd be where we were uh, before. And we've seen in uh, Victoria, it's not, but I think the case in New Zealand is uh, instructive too, where they had had 100 days without a case and thought that possibly it was eradicated and they could just go on and yet we're seeing the virus re-emerge there. And I think the reality is until we have a, a vaccine that is uh, A, effective, but also universally adopted, we're going to be in this sort of state. And on that point, even I think a lot of people think that a vaccine, once again, will be a binary issue. Once we have that, all the problems are over. I think there's a very strong uh, possibility that vaccine, even if we have one, is going to be not 100% effective and it will need us to continue to change our behaviours, to have social distancing, to wear masks, to do all of these things, even with a vaccine. So we need to go through these various scenarios and have an honest discussion with the public, not this sort of approach of, oh, well, we've just got to get through it and uh, by Christmas it'll all be in the past. Uh, I, there has to be that honest discussion and people then have to think about how they're gonna shift their behaviors permanently. This is a challenging discussion, isn't it? Because there is that denial, there's that, I just want things to go back to normal. And, and Cheryl, when I think of sort of military preparedness, I think primarily of kind of structural and logistics and the kind of nuts and bolts of military preparedness, but, but there's an emotional side to military preparedness as well, isn't there? It's not just kind of physical structures around us. I think, Kumi, it's more a, an intellectual dimension or a thinking dimension of preparedness. Because a lot of preparedness comes from the mindset of being prepared, of, of being wanting to actually look at those futures, which might be quite horrible to look at. And certainly um, on, on top of what John has said, we're now coming up into the traditional disaster season in Australia and we, we still have the, the COVID crisis. So how are we thinking we will respond should a, a major disaster hit at a time where we're in a hard lockdown, that, that's sort of a really horrible thing to look at, but you have to be prepared to look at it. And you have to be prepared to look at it realistically and come up with a set of actions that you're, if not happy with, I won't say, now sometimes there aren't good lots of actions, there are only least worst actions, but come up with a set of actions you're satisfied with because one of the really powerful things about preparedness is having a sense that you can do something about it. Because having a sense of agency and, and John's, I might throw to John as the, expert in behaviours, having a sense of agency or ability to have choices and take action is a really powerful mechanism of dealing with these crises. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And if you look at some of the insights into uh, behavioural theory, uh, one I've indicated already is social norms, what other people are doing. But another key driver is people's belief that the actions that they take will be effective. So do people have confidence that a particular behaviour will make a difference? And are they motivated uh, to do it? And in order to have people do that, you've got to have a very open and honest discussion with people. 
and you've got to give them the information and engage with them about that. And I think generally in Australia on our response, we're doing reasonably well on that. You'd have to compare us to say the United States where there's this total political conflict over even issues like wearing masks. Uh, you know, it's amazing here, you go out in the streets and most people are comfortably wearing masks and it's not a sign of which political party you vote for. And yet in America, it's become almost a political statement for one side or the other. And so having that discussion in a way that's open, transparent, non-partisan is critical. When you have those discussions, and you mentioned a few times, John, open and honest as the two words you, you see as the most valuable in terms of conversations. What are the key elements that motivate people to change? Not only kind of seeing behaviours, but, but do we use language that, based, that is based on fear or control? Or would you, do we lose language that is based on uh, future and hope? Like, are there, are there different words that help us navigate this space? Well, that's a really good question. So uh, once again, there's quite a bit of research in behaviour that would indicate uh, that the source of the message is quite important. So who is communicating the message? Uh, in this area we're talking about of responding to COVID, you also need to take account of who the target is, who the target audience is. And the same message, uh, whether it's you know hope or uh, what other people are doing will not necessarily work with every group. It's quite interesting, for example, we've been doing some research at uh, our institute uh, through Behaviour Works Australia on people's activities during COVID and their responses uh, to the pandemic, things like washing hands, wearing masks. And what you see, uh, and we've just done some, uh, say, in New South Wales, a big difference in the uh, level of people wearing masks in different age groups. So in the 18 to 29 year old age group, I think it's about 13% of people wearing masks. Whereas in the 30 to 40, 40 to 50, it's more than double that. So if you're going to want people to wear masks, you're gonna to have to have that target group, say those younger people, 18 to 29, and work out a message that's going to appeal to them. And I can't just tell you, you actually have to research that. You have to see what works. Interestingly, in the research we did, it also appeared that the older cohort of over 60 in New South Wales weren't wearing the masks as much as the, the middle-aged either. And maybe there are particular issues around that, which once again, I think you have to research and then find out why. Uh, that older cohort aren't wearing masks and find some way uh, to encourage them to do that. So uh, there's a, a, an approach where you look at the message, but also the target. Cheryl, just talking about this, I just had this image in my mind of how resilient I think we need to become. You know, we've got, you mentioned this kind of disaster season upon us. Uh, we might have bushfires on top of an ongoing COVID crisis on top of whatever else might be, be thrown at us. And it feels like there's going to be layer potentially upon layer of uh, kind of preparedness that we need to uh, get our heads around. How important is this kind of idea of, of resilience? And I guess understanding that there's not a perfect end goal and end point to all this, but we need to acknowledge that it's, it's ongoing. Well, I think, um, Kumi, resilience is a, a, a key concept and, and something we need to think a bit more about in Australia. But part of this is, I think, our fairly unique history in that most Australians have had a pretty lucky run. We have, um, haven't have really had a major war. It's a long, long time ago now. There's a very few that have had experienced that. And even then, it's not like my parents' experience when my mother was, you know, stukered while she was being evacuated from London. We haven't had that really existential threat to our lives and livelihoods. But now as we go through it into, into COVID and beyond, we may be experiencing those type of crises. So I think part of the Australian culture is we're, we're a lucky country, she'll be right. And I think that's one of the, the critical things we need to challenge. And I think it's really important that John mentioned... Um, 
truth and trust and openness and transparency. I think it's it's really critical that as we go forward, this is not a, just a top down a process of government telling us what to do or telling us what to expect. A lot of the real innovation and resilience is coming from communities and there's inspiring stories almost every day of, of how communities responded in the bushfires and also in, in the Melbourne lockdown and, and the COVID crisis. I think we need to celebrate that often we have, and I think someone mentioned earlier, a sort of tendency to, to focus on blame. I think we need to focus on what's going well and celebrate that and build on top of that rather than focus on what's going wrong. We need to understand what went wrong because we need to fix it. But I think it's much better to look at the real positives that we see in Australian society's response to COVID and how we can take that forward into an uncertain future world. And in a sense, it sounds like, Cheryl, you're kind of saying we can sort of take some power back into our own hands, a sense of agency, because so much of this feels like there's so much out of our control. We, we don't know. We can't predict. Uh, we don't know when we can travel, get on a plane, uh, say goodbye to our loved ones. So much seems to be in the hands of uh, rules, really, um, and, and policy at this point in time. In a sense, I think what you're saying is, you know, we can take control of, of the narrative in our, in our own way, ways as well. Yeah, I think that's right, Kumi, uh, up to a certain point. So I think this is a partnership between the citizens of society, the communities, the individuals, the business and government. And traditionally, we in Australia, again, we've really only had this engagement at the federal level once every three years with an election. I think that needs now to be a much more frequent process, just as the, the National Cabinet now is, is meeting much more frequently and that, that cooperation between state and, and federal government levels has improved and we, we've seen that the good things come from that closeness. So I think this really now, now needs to be also an acceptance of, as an individual, everyone can be resilient or prepared to some extent. At a very simplest level, the, the most fundamental thing for human survival is water. Uh, luckily, water's free in Australia. So if, you, if you've got 48 hours worth of water in your home or one week or two weeks, you've got some level of resilience. It's a simple, easy thing people can do. Just like also knowing where your local medical um, um, location is, if you haven't been, if you're new, just knowing wh which neighbours may be unable to help themselves and helping them. There are really lots of simple steps that everyone can do to, to some extent. But at the level above that, we need to make sure that we have the processes in place. I think John, John spoke to that, where there's a consultation, open consultation between communities, government and groups of experts about what we need to do for the future. John, you were Deputy Premier of Victoria from 1999 for eight years. Um, what's been running through your mind, particularly with uh, those of you joining us from, from Melbourne in particular and broader Victoria, knowing that you're back into lockdown and, and it's quite a long road for you. Yeah, when you look at this, John, do you think, my goodness, if I, if I was Deputy Premier now, you know, what kind of life you would be living and the decisions you might have to be making? Well, certainly the first thing that's running through my mind is I'm um, very glad I'm not uh, the minister now because uh, the level of pressure is extraordinary. And the other thing about COVID is it's just so unforgiving. It seems to have the ability to find every little gap or uh, neek, nip in, in, in policy or practice. So it is very tough for decision makers now. Uh, they really are under huge pressure. Uh, I think that in Australia, I agree with Cheryl, we haven't suffered the sort of disasters that some previous generations have, but I do believe the bushfires have been helpful in putting, making us more aware of disasters and the need for collaborative action across the community and government to meet the disasters. And I do actually think one of the reasons we did better at the start of this pandemic than a lot of other countries like the UK is that we are actually coming out of the bushfire season where we were already in a state of emergency and where our uh, structures for emergency management were already underway and our politicians were used to responding to that. So I think we've had some benefits in that and there are certainly uh, a lot of experiences people in bushfire communities have had which I think we can learn from as we 
now respond to COVID. And one of them, I think, is this bottom-up community building around the response and the recovery, which will be really important because COVID is going to have a very uneven impact on different communities. So some communities, for example, communities that have relied on tourism are going to be hit a lot harder than others where they can rely more on uh, what they were doing before. For example, you know, we're seeing in West Australia, commodities are still going very well. So those uh, e exports are still holding up very strongly. Whereas if you're in the tourism industry or the arts industry, you have been just knocked out of the park. So I think we need to also with this discussion, understand the very uneven impact this is having. There are some groups who are much more vulnerable than others. Uh, there's certainly a lot of discussion about people in casual jobs, people at the front line in terms of uh, still out there working and facing more of a health risk. And I think as a society, we've got to really respond to that. Just unmuting there. Cheryl, I'm thinking of, you know, preparedness. We're talking a lot about, you know, Australia and, and what we have and, and potentially how we need to look at our own luck in a sense of how, how good we've had it for so long. This has also got this added layer of global, a global, huge global kind of disaster where the impact of how other countries manage COVID impacts on us and trade and there's so many other elements to it. Is that, you know, can you think of an example that is similar to this where you're not only having to kind of have this disaster preparedness and this unpredictability within your own country, but also linking in with every single other country around the world? Well, I think increasingly we're going to see these type of global challenges and we do need to take more than just a, a national inward looking look and, and response. To be really resilient, Australia still requires goods and services from overseas. So we can't just close our borders um, to everything. We, we still need to have suppliers coming in and we still need the countries that produce those supplies to have the capability and, and be robust and look after them. And in, in Tasmania, there's a, a very simple example with the, the fruit picking, where we've had um, a reliance on workforces, both uh, international travellers, but also a large workforce from Pacific Island states which are part of our Pacific family. And we can't just look after ourselves. We've also got to think about how we support those countries be resilient and also those countries be prepared. And so there's a need. Um, and I think the, the COVID crisis, in, initially we focused on ourselves and, and that's quite reasonable. There's some people, as John has said, doing it really tough where others are seeing some opportunities with COVID. But I think Australia has an opportunity to position itself globally and, and really fight for those international institutions that unfortunately with some of the leaders we've seen recently in around the world have, have been weakened and we need to step up and, and support those as well. So there's there's a bit of global goodness in that. There's also a bit of self-interest because that's, that's what we need as well. And I'll just jump in there and endorse that 100% that there's a real danger that we could revert to sort of nationalism and try to just put up walls. But what we know about uh, COVID is that it is a global problem and it will find the weakest link. And if there's some part of the world where they're particularly vulnerable and the infection spreads particularly badly, that's going to come out to the rest of the world. And so really you've got to look at the most vulnerable, not only in our own country, but in, our, in, in the world and in our region. And the best way to do that is to manage things in a global cooperative way. Of course, the other issue is in relation to global cooperation around vaccines and therapeutic medicines. Once again, unfortunately, there's been a bit of a tendency uh, and you know, obviously uh, you know, we haven't mentioned the name, but the president of the United States has sort of pushed this uh, nationalistic approach around vaccines too as well as pulling the US out of the WHO, just disastrous decisions, so short-sighted. The whole uh, success of vaccines in abolishing or virtually eradicating things like polio has been around cooperation. And as someone was saying 
polio vaccine was developed in collaboration between the USA and the Soviet Union at the height of the Cold War. And yet now you know, we seem to have this ridiculous antagonism, particularly now involving the US and China. And that is the last thing that we want or need if we're gonna meet this huge challenge. Cheryl, as we, as we head towards sort of wrapping up um, this Melbourne Conversations, it's just fantastic to have both of your insights. Thank you so, so much. For everyone listening today and perhaps feeling a sense of either whether it's powerlessness or unpredictability and not knowing where we go in, in future, what would be, I guess, a, a bit of advice to kind of help, help us along this and to make us feel like we can kind of take some agency and some sense of control over of what we can't control at the moment? Or do you want to go first, Gerald? Oh, you're on mute, I think. If you if you want to take that one first, John. Okay, I'll, I'm I'm fine. So, well, look, I think in Australia we can take some uh, confidence from the fact that despite the challenges in Victoria at the moment, overall we're regarded as having responded uh, well by global standards, and there's been a level of bipartisanship. To a degree, it gets frayed at times, but it's it's still pretty good. There's also, I think, as um, people have highlighted, a greater respect for science and expertise and perhaps we've had around other issues like climate change. On this issue, we do seem to have really listened to the experts and that's positive. So uh, what I'd take out of this is that we can work together, we can work collaboratively and we can listen to the experts. And I hope that we also adopt that approach as we try to meet the other big challenges like climate change. And I should just jump in, my apologies, I got my timing totally wrong. So we've still got a wonderful half hour left for questions. So Cheryl, I might get to you and get your wrap up a bit later, but what I might do, John and Cheryl, is go to some questions. We've had some great questions come through from you listening in, thank you so much. I believe we've got at least 200 people on today. Um, lots of questions coming in from YouTube. So um, here's one from Elise, thank you so much, Elise. Um, is there a stronger role our education system can play in training our next generation to be more open to think about possible scenarios, but also more politically engaged and resilient. Cheryl, I might, might send that to you in terms of how do we educate our next generation to be kind of prepared? Well, I think this is a really great question. And the, the first question is, do we value our educators enough? I think as we're finding with COVID that teachers, carers, um, and cleaners are really critical professions. And, and so the first thing about going forward in education is, is really valuing um, our educators. And I'm, I'm also a real fan of the, of the creative arts and the arts as part of an education and a balanced education. And I think we have in many ways too much focus on STEM. I, th I think STEAM, we're adding the arts to it is critical. I think it's also critical to have interdisciplinary thinkers. I think one of the, the weaknesses of, of modern society is there's lots of experts, but they're experts in very narrow fields. And I think um, particularly at our universities, we need to look at more interdisciplinary and, and transdisciplinary degrees. So we, we develop systems thinkers because all our problems are really big, messy, systemic problems, which require a bit of analytics and a bit of creativity and a bit of engineering and a bit of mathematical modeling and a bit of uh, creative arts and some storytelling to be part of a solution. So I think uh, really investing in our education, it's, it's quite disappointing to see the opposite happening with our recovery from COVID is, is where, the, where the money's been going to. It needs to equally go across um, arts, culture and, and education. Uh, thanks, Cheryl. And that kind of transitions quite well into a question um, here from Hema. It's wonderful having your questions come through. Thank you so much. You can pop them in the YouTube comment sections or also um, email us if you can, conversations at melbourne.vic.gov.au. Uh, John, um, I might throw this one to, to you. Hema's asking, so how can we effectively stop thinking in the binary? We've talked a lot about this of, you know, either normal and crisis, good and bad, you know, how, how can we kind of think outside those, those binary ways of looking at what we're going through? Well, I, I think that scenario planning type of process is, is the best, where you actually engage with people and 
get them to look look and describe the different scenarios with help of people who have some expertise in it. Now, you could say, you know, is this a process people are going to want to go through? Well, actually, a number of communities are doing it. Uh, we're doing a project, once again, with Monash, working with uh, rural and regional communities on implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. And that all sounds a bit, you know, theoretical until you actually have the conversation at the grassroots with you know, ordinary people in rural communities about what matters to them and how that links to these basic objectives of good health, uh, education opportunities, healthy environment, uh, and a, a good job with good conditions, which is essentially what the Sustainable Development Goals are about. And when you have these discussions and you look at different scenarios and how we could achieve them, people actually come around with really considered and good proposals. And so I think it's more about having more of these conversations, more of these processes in communities and less sort of straight out political partisanship around these discussions, understanding that these are big challenges that we face and we need to face them together. And that actually links quite nicely to this question from Elise, and, and I'm not sure both of you might want to jump jump in. Um, how can people engage with our leaders and government constructively, influence decisions, and then take action in their own lives and communities? I suppose it's that kind of how do we find that that middle ground and actually take that action? Well, I, I might just uh, jump in, and, and I think this addresses sort of this question and the previous one. There was some great work done by the Department of Home Affairs on profiling Australia's vulnerabilities. And part of that was having a conversation about what we really value, um, because as, in addition to scenario planning, truly understanding our values enables us to have a conversation about how those values might be intention. And for those who have not visited the Australian Institute of Disaster Resilience Knowledge Hub, there's some really great uh, references and work and resources on that uh, to help move forward. And that values conversation really teases out this, this non-binary perspective. And it's a conversation where Home Affairs went out and spoke to local communities and they spoke to local responders. So there are government departments realising the need and getting out and getting that grassroots feedback. Um, so if you have that opportunity in your um, area, um, turn up. The first thing to do, turn up and have a conversation. R write to your um, parliamentarians, get involved in, in, in civic civic action, because that sort of gives us self-reinforcing to those in government who are doing this type of work. But a classic example of one of the, the values intention non-binary is, is some short-term solutions versus long-term solutions. And a classic example of that is um, on beachfront erosion, which has been a big problem in uh, the south, south coast and, and, and Sydney. And the short-term solution might be to reinforce that with concrete. And there's a value there. The people, those properties have values. People want to have a safe house, and that's a, that's an important value. But that's in tension with a longer term uh, approach because concrete is a really high emissions material, and it's contributing towards sea level rise. So you're basically making the solution worse while solving it. So I think that is a non-binary issue, and you need to have a way of which you can have without rancor or blame or, or conflict discussions about where do we make the trade-offs. And uh, I'll give another example. I'm chair of Melbourne Water and Cheryl talked about the importance of water before, but we've just been having all of these great engagements with the community around what we should be doing in the next five years. And as chair of the board, uh, I attended the all virtual now, they're on Zoom. And you have all of these people who were just sort of randomly uh, agreed to be part of this, making some really fascinating contributions. And one of the interesting things I thought about that was how it crossed different cultural uh, divides, whereas actually in most of our lives, we tend to stick with our own language and cultural background group. So we had people in the group, Chinese or European or Anglo-Celtic, and it was a fantastic discussion to hear all of these people. So I think promoting more opportunities like that and it doesn't always have to be from the top. Uh, it can be local councils. It can be businesses having these discussions. And one of the things I think we get the benefits of this whole COVID situation is going to be people are going to be prepared to 
have more of these Zoom online type discussions. We'll probably have a break for a month or so. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's shown that we can get together pretty easily and have a good discussion about the future, future opportunities in a way we didn't before. That sense of future is coming up in, in quite a few of the questions too. Uh, you know, just anecdotally, I think all of us would know that a lot of us talk about, you know, well, what's going to come out of this? Can we be a better society out of this? Can we, will things shift permanently? And a, a question here from Kapu is, uh, Australians have emphasised consumption and comfort throughout this time. Do you think as a society, we have the courage and patience to agree upon and implement a more equitable and just future? Well, I'll start on that. I mean, in some ways, you've got to say in Australia, we, through this, have demonstrated a much greater capacity for considering vulnerable groups and equity than we normally do. And the classic example of that, I would say, was the JobKeeper uh, benefit, which was a flat amount paid to everybody uh, by comparison with what we normally do, which is really screw the um, people that need welfare as much as possible. And, and if you look at unemployment benefits in Australia, until the pandemic, they've been at a disgraceful level, like 70% of the poverty line. And yet in the pandemic, the process has actually given a much more reasonable and equitable uh, income support. So I guess the answer to the question is, uh, this does provide an opportunity when people are thinking in a different way, when there's been a discontinuance in our normal habits and thinking to actually shift to a more equitable approach. I'm not gonna say that it's gonna you know, be Nirvana afterwards. I'm sure we'll fall back largely to where we were before, but at least it's shown a capacity to start thinking in, in this broader and more equitable way. So I'd sort of like to, to build upon that. And I, I think the, the courage question came out there. And I think we do have the courage and the imagination to envisage a better future. Will we get there? Is the, the action is the question. I think we really have to be just aware too that there are powerful vested interests wanting us to, to snap back or go back to where we were. But the, the bulk of Australians, and, and as part of the Climate Council, we, we've looked at what, what people are wanting. People tend to, we want an equitable world. We want a world where um, well-being and, you know, a, a, you know, ability to sort of have a fair go and, and you know, live a, live a useful and purposeful life that's not just comfortable but ha has some goodness to it as well. And I think COVID has forced us to reflect, as John has said, not only in the equitables but on what we really value. And one of the learnings from the vulnerability profile was that as a crisis hits, we, we reevaluate what's important to us. And certainly I'm happy to give up a few comforts. I, I did uh, miss my coffee while I was in hotel, good coffee in hotel quarantine for, for two weeks, but it wasn't critical to me. There were things that were much more important such as family and, and friends and, and nature. So I think in general, we all have this tendency to, to want that better place. And it really is the challenge to, to everyone who's part of this conversation is to take action to get us there because the actions lots of actions from lots of people uh, create the momentum to go forward to, to a better place. And it's a critical, we're at a critical fork in the roads and you only have to look at America to say, this is where we don't want to go. We do not want to go down that bipartisan path in America where the can't even have a conversation to go forward. It's, it's so divided that there, there is a difficult to see, even with a change in president, how America moves forward. Australia's not there yet, but it could go there but it could also go and build upon the collaboration and conversations. And it's critical. Everyone go and have a conversation about the future you want with someone and, and those small things build momentum. And just, just be conscious that we have the opportunity not just to, to recover from COVID, but create jobs in, in industries that we want for the future. Do we want a clean, renewable, environmentally sustainable Australia? Or do we want a, a sort of dirty, coal-driven industrial Australia or, or some balance between because it won't be black and white? I, I do have to say that my coffee machine broke down four days before stage four was introduced in Victoria and I managed to get it fixed in time before I couldn't have left 
And had that not happened, I probably wouldn't be here today. So I'm happy for you, John. Like, I mean, seriously, you know, the coffee in Australia, that should be our number one value, I think, at the core of who we are. This is a fantastic conversation, a Melbourne Conversations event. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is run by the City of Melbourne. We've still got about 15 minutes or so to take your questions. It's wonderful to have those too. So pop them into that YouTube chat and you can email them to us as well, conversations at melbourne.vic.gov.au. We're talking with Cheryl Durrant and John Thwaites, uh, wonderful guests for us today, talking through this extraordinary time we're living in and will continue to live in. Uh, kind of following up from where we were before, um, Antonia's sort of pressing on that, that sort of what future do we want. Uh, Antonia's asked, um, how do you get the world to listen to our medical, scientific and military experts and make changes when so much of our world is controlled by big business, the economy and the desire to make money? Well, I'm happy to kick it off. Uh, well, I actually think in the COVID situation, the world is listening to medical expertise far more than they are, for example, in climate change. Uh, and generally speaking, most countries are now following uh, the, the medical advice, the scientific advice. And the reason for that is because the impact of COVID is so immediate and so devastating that it's really hard for vested interests to oppose that. The challenge for other issues like climate change is that the impact is not so immediate. It's, uh, it's apparent, but it's not so immediately devastating. And alternative uh, explanations can be given for it and are given for it. Uh, and so vested interests have a much easier time to um, push their, their selfish barrow, frankly than they do in COVID. And so I don't actually have, you know, gigantic optimism that this will turn around that and that we'll see expertise used uh, in the climate and biodiversity areas in a way that, uh, that we would like. Uh, I think we, we have to though, or we'll have, you know, potentially an even more devastating impact as the scientists tell us climate change will be affecting you know, hundreds of millions of people. So uh, what, we have to, what we have to do is continue to make the argument. I think on climate change, what we're seeing with the Climate Council, and Cheryl will talk more about this, is that what will motivate people is not so much just you know, fear of what will happen if we don't, but actually the huge benefits of what happened if we do. And we're seeing that now with renewables and it's almost like despite all the vested interests, the renewables are winning because they're actually better, they're cheaper, healthier. And so convincing people of that will probably be a successful pathway. But I'd hand over to Cheryl on that. Yeah, so, so John makes a good point. A lot of businesses are seeing opportunity, but also they're, they're seeing the need to adjust. In fact, some businesses in America and Australia are moving much more quickly than, than governments. And that's because big businesses with long long term interests or thinking strategically have worked out that, that they need to move away um, from fossil fuels and they need to invest in different types of industries for the future. And, there, and there's massive, there's heaps of jobs in um, renewable energies. And I think if you if you dive down, there's there's actually much less jobs in fossil fuel industries. There's, it's a sort of myth that, uh, you know, it's it's individually tough if you're working in that fossil fuel industry, but overall there is actually heaps of opportunity in renewables and heaps of opportunity in sort of a, a green or clean recovery. And certainly climate change is tough, but if you look at some of the big business decisions recently, and the one that's been in the press in Australia is BHP's decision to move away from, from fossil fuel investments and commit to a, a 2050 net zero emissions target. And that's driven not just by the, the company understanding its risk, but it's also driven by people on um, who are shareholders going and asking that company to do so. So I think that we, we have much more power as individuals than we think we do. Sometimes we think, oh, it's just me. If, if, if you know, I'm not going to make a difference. 
but actually, if, you, if, if there's enough of, enough of us going and demanding those um, uh, super funds to, to move out of um, a certain type of uh, industry and move into another industry, well, over time, if enough people do that, things shift and things are shifting and it's the futures um, focused industries. So mining, fossil fuels and super funds. The, these organisations have to take a long term view because that's how their, their profit works. And that these are the ones starting to to move. So get on the get on the get onto the board, get onto the um, shareholders, write to your super fund, and demand action. You know, we collectively create the different world. And I think it's it's a bit of a cop out to say that there are don't be, be be aware of the vested interests, but don't give in to them. It's interesting how much climate has come up in our conversation today. Um, even though we're kind of focusing on on a pandemic, really, because of that sort of. You know, predicting the unpredictable. John has asked uh, through a YouTube question, um, how is climate action related to this pandemic and to preventing future pandemics? I know that's kind of an epidemiologist in a way, and that's kind of a question that might be outside our, our areas of expertise, but there, there does seem to be such a link and people are kind of talking about pandemic and climate. It's sort of often in the same sentence these days. Well, that's right. I mean, they're, and they're doing that for a number of reasons. One is that climate change does remain as an existential threat. I mean, there will be um, huge health implications of climate change. There already are. We've seen the fires exacerbated. We've seen now you know, huge floods in um, Bangladesh. We've seen uh, drought. Uh, exacerbated in Australia, but throughout the world. So there's already huge impacts, but this is at one degree of warming. Uh, we're already pretty much locked into two degrees or more of warming. So uh, I think that's one reason, because it's a huge threat. But I think there are some direct connections too, where uh, the impacts of COVID are likely to be exacerbated uh, if we have uh, air pollution, unhealthy environments. So there's a, a direct impact there, just as we're seeing the link between uh, human activity and the rise of zoonotic diseases like uh, the pandemic. So essentially it's where humans are coming in close contact with wild animals, where there's a, a change in the natural state that's where you get this jump from wild animals of the disease, often uh, through other vectors, could be through other animals and then into humans. So in the, I think in, we talk about this concept of the Anthropocene where humans run everything and we're in control of everything. What COVID shows us is that actually that's not true, that we're not able to just control everything. And if we have that idea that we can just control everything for climate change, it's gonna be the same. We have to have greater respect for nature, for biodiversity, for the planet. And if we do that, we're less likely to have pandemics like COVID and we're less likely to suffer seriously from climate change. I'd just like to agree with everything, with everything John said. In defence, we used to describe climate change as a threat multiplier. It does make everything worse, as well as being in itself an existential threat. So unless we are respecting and, and valuing nature and having a, and John mentioned earlier, the sustainable development goals, it's, it's critical to have a future recovery that's sustainable. And the good news is that as we recover from COVID, as we plan to go forward from that, we can tackle both crises at the same time. We can choose a recovery that also deals with climate change and makes future pandemics less likely. And we can also make a, a sort of recovery that makes the, the probability of bushfires and floods reduces those, makes us more resilient, um, makes us aware of where we need to situate our cities and properties. And, and one of the really frustrating things in a, is the missed opportunity to spend some of the recovery money on on resilience for bushfires and what, what a great opportunity to support jobs in construction but also build back homes that are more resilient replacing wooden fences with with colour bond fences and and other things that increase personal resilience so i think again it's it's 
there are really positive things that can come out of the, the COVID recovery that also address climate change. And it, it is that, that big, if you like, you know, I've seen a great cartoon with a little COVID wave and a massive climate change wave. And, and that's what climate change is. It's the massive wave behind COVID. There's an interesting question here uh, from Les on email and it seems to sort of relate directly to this too. Um, how do we avoid or prevent situations where the person, man in charge of the COVID advisory committee has obvious conflict of interests in terms of his relationship to the gas industry and such groups are not accountable nor transparent in the way they operate in advising government? It's an interesting question. John, I might throw that to, to you. Um, first. Yeah, well, I, I suppose, you know, everyone has vested interests to a degree. Um, and so we need to be clear about that. I'm not sure how much uh, the COVID Commission's advice is going to be accepted. And they haven't, as far as I can see, even concluded their advice yet. So I would certainly be arguing that uh, a, a major investment in, in gas now would not only be uh, stupid for the environment, it's not all that smart economically either. Uh, when, as I said before, renewables are the most efficient and they're the future. And it's what the rest of the world is want to, going to want to get into. And the opportunity Australia has to use the incredible renewable resource we've got to then export that through um, green hydrogen, green steel, um, renewable energy exports. There's huge opportunities, as Ross Garno has pointed out. So I would hope that that's the uh, pathway that we'd, we'd be going down. I'd just like to add that there's, as citizens, we also need to pay attention to, to how our society operates. So reflecting back, I've been sort of advocating for, for climate change now for over a decade, and I'm a newbie. But if I had my time back 10 years ago, I would be advocating for greater transparency in political donations. Uh, John mentioned transparency before. It's critical that we, we it's legitimate to have a vested interest, but it's, it, you need to have an open, honest conversation about it. And the other thing I would be advocating for is um, uh, sort of uh, press freedoms and, and ensuring we don't have a monopolistic press, because that's one of the, the big things that makes open, transparent, trusted information flows difficult. So it's those structural things in society that we, we need as citizens to, to pay a little bit of attention to, because those are the things that when we really need urgent and quick change are the roadblocks. We're starting to get to the tail end of our fantastic conversation today, Cheryl Durrant and John Thraits, and it's wonderful having you join us too from wherever you're joining us, probably a lot of you from, from home, and I hope you're keeping safe and well in this time. It's been wonderful having your company in my home. I thought I might end with this question from Suzanne who emailed it through to us, and I know there's a few questions we haven't got to, so thank you so much for sending them through. We so appreciate your interaction with us today. Suzanne wants to know, Wondering your thoughts on the promotion of self-care for people impacted, laughter clubs, free online resources. How do you think we can promote these resources for our resilience? Uh, well, I, I certainly think that uh, laughter clubs are a good idea in comedy and we're, we were doing the weekly um, comedy Zoom on Thursday nights, uh, which unfortunately with stage four is as dropped out of the system but we're actually watching quite a bit of comedy and I think at a time like this having a laugh is one of the best things you can do uh, it must be incredibly hard for stand-ups to do it on zoom I must say without a response I don't know how they do it but some people have incredible talent so I would support that I think things like this are great uh, people are engaging intellectually uh, more than they normally do. I mean, I'm almost just brain tired, frankly, the number of uh, intellectual discussions I'm having, where before I'd be spending it commuting or uh, you know, just sort of getting in and out of work and moving from one thing to another. So we're actually focusing on that. So I think looking after yourself, being able to have a laugh and a smile, have a plenty of exercise, eat well, all of those things are really good. And, and I might say that the competition to cook sourdough bread. I haven't actually done that, but I've made 
hot cross buns and a few things like that that I never would have done before and got a lot of pleasure out of it. Yeah, I just like to agree. I think humour is is a really critical part of Australian personality, and I've certainly got through some hard times by reading some of our fabulous uh, cartoons. Um, so yes, it, important. Everyone does look after personal well being and, and family well being. So you can't be resilient or be prepared if if you yourself are struggling and under the pump. And 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 so that that individual goodness is a foundation of pretty much everything else. Well, Cheryl and John, it's been such a pleasure having you uh, join this conversation today. Your expertise, your insights, your honesty uh, is most valued. Thank you so, so much. Uh, thank you so much to you for joining us at home uh, for this Melbourne Conversations event. Uh, there's a link in the YouTube video description to a survey, which if you've got time, the City of Melbourne team would really love to hear your thoughts on the event and send them that feedback. And thank you so much. That's the end of our event today. Uh, goodbye and I hope you have a wonderful day and keep safe and well.